And I think that's uh, part of being a leader, really, isn't it? Like it's it's about coaching, mentoring, and uh, you know when I talk to emerging leaders and my students, it's really about um, yeah, how do we how do we how do we mentor others? How do we enable others? And I think that's an important question that we should ask and we should ask uh, when we're working with uh, with co- with clients as well. Is you know how are they mentoring? How are they enabling others? And so, yeah, it's that kind of education of practice freedom is the same thing in, in coaching as well. That, uh, yeah, how are we enabling others to uh, wake up in the world and to, to lead? Hello, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our weekly webinar. And thank you so much for pouring in, joining in us from all the places in the world. Please feel free to use the chat box to let us know where you're joining from. I can see some of the known faces, names, not really faces. Welcome, Budapest. Okay, welcome, Vera. And um, welcome, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to have you here. And before we begin, I would like to say a note of gratitude to all of you who keep our community alive and active and give us a purpose to keep showing up every week and uh, keep bringing in uh, new conversations. So while we are all joining us from the different places in the world. Oh, so we've got from British Columbia, Canada too. Welcome, Laurie. Uh, Okay. So allow me to introduce today's conversation and today's guest who we have. Um, So as you know, this month, we've been following up a theme of challenging the status quo. And uh, August is a special month because we get one additional week to have the conversation. And in today's conversation, I am accompanied by Professor William Kent, uh, Professor Kent William, sorry, Professor, I always sort of confuse between your first name and last name. Anyway, <laughs> Dr. Kent is a assistant professor at the Faculty of Management in Rose School of Business in Canada. And apart from being a professor, he also has a leadership consulting practice, which he calls Integral Dialogue Project. Uh, He holds a doctorate in social science, and there is much more to him, which I'm sure we are going to explore and observe during our conversation. And you being the coaches, I'm sure you will pick up a lot more nuances about him as an individual. So... uh, Without further ado, welcome, Professor Kent. Welcome to our community of coaches. It's a pleasure to be here um, with everybody as coming together as a learning community, as as always, as I always say. And I just want to start by saying that uh, I'm coming from the I'm standing in the traditional territory of Kluskap of the Mi'kmaq. And um, yeah, I always like to recognize the uh, sacredness of, of this place, this land, and uh, recognize the unceded territory, the, the Mi'kmaq people. And not only is this great from a reconciliation standpoint, but I think it's great to honor the, the elders and ancients of the past, present, and, and the future, and also really um, embrace the... Uh, these mindsets that, that really connect to the idea of reciprocity and interdependence. So I just wanted to start my uh, my hello with, with that. And just again, say it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. 
Thank you so much. And for all the people who are joining us from different parts of the world who are not from Canada, and just to give them a little context of uh, Professor Kent's greeting was also the land acknowledgement. And this, this is an idea that I got to know when I came uh, relocated from India to Canada, Professor Kent, and it was I, I was very curious and I was really appreciative of the idea of land acknowledgement. Like never before I thought of like that, that we are all sort of immigrants, we are all sort of have been given certain lands to live on and to, you know, manifest whatever we are here to manifest and that by acknowledging the land, by acknowledging the people who nourished this land, our ancestors, we sort of establish a connection with them. We sort of express our gratitude. So thank you so much for bringing that land acknowledgement in this place. And uh, with that, you know, I know that we will be talking about eco-coaching uh, today, which a lot of your work and your leadership consulting work sort of surrounds that. But before we go there, I have another intriguing question about you. Uh, when you shared about you, you know, I came across your belief that pedagogy of edu education as a practice of freedom. Now, contrary to how education is being practiced currently in the world, it's more around uh, we get educated to get the degrees and qualifications so that we can sort of sustain our life. We can go to lucrative careers. So would you say a little bit about like, how do you see education as a practice of freedom? Well, I think it really connects to the coaching as well. And uh, I'll share a a quote that I just happen to have here in front of me. This is um, by Amanda Sinclair. She says, leadership should be aimed at helping to free people from oppressive structures, practices, and habits encountered in uh, in societies and institutions as well within from the shady recesses of ourself. And I think that, you know, the world that we we come from, especially in the Western world, you know, colonial capitalist uh, frameworks, that really have kind of uh, marginalized and pressed many people that really don't fit into what that idea of what capitalism should be, uh, really where the focus is on profit maximization, shareholder primacy. Uh, and really this is how we've taught in our institutions, really uh, bringing, educating, where it's more of uh, what uh, Paulo Freire would refer to as a banking system and a transaction where I'm the expert professor and I'm just going to give you the information and you are to, you know, just listen and uh, really embody what I'm telling you. And really the education of practice of freedom and, you know, comes from I would say is a spouse from people like Paulo Ferreira, Bell Hooks, who recently uh, passed away, uh, Parker Palmer, mm -hmm. folks like that, that really talk about um, we enter as a, you know, my role as a professor with students or even as a coach and coachees, we enter into a relationship mm -hmm. where, where, where we learn together and that through this process of really showing up in a dialogic way, it really enables agency. And I guess that's where this uh, practice of, of free education as a practice of freedom is really all uh, really about setting up a holding environment that allows people's voice to be heard so that they're, they can build that agency to be free. And I really believe that this is important in our world where uh, we come from many different societies and cultures and, and we talk about diversity and inclusion. That's really where innovation is. I think that we don't have the answers to many of the challenges that we're faced with today. And so we need all hands on deck. We need all diversity to really come to, into um, the picture. And I think through that education as a practice of freedom, it really allows uh, agency, allows people's voices that were marginalized in the past. Uh, to really come awake and be heard. And I think that's where the opportunity lies for humanity as we take on challenges like the, the grand challenge of climate crisis. I mean, you just need to tune into the news. Um, I 
read uh, uh, media outlets like The Guardian a lot. And when you read uh, some of the headlines, it's it can be pretty depressing in this dystopian world, but there's no doubt that we're seeing a drought throughout the world. Uh, and this is causing pressure for all of us and we're in this together. And so again, I think uh, this is the idea that we really need to come together in these learning communities that really enable people's voices to be free and um, yeah, awakened. So I, don't know if that, I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, absolutely. And I like the way you said that it includes coaching as well, because if we consider coaching to be one of the interventions into adult learning practice, I think as coaches, we are here to, you know, help our clients become free, become free of the constructions of the mind and use their voice or even first of all to find their voice and then use it to the right course and concerns so in a way i see and in what you've shared i see view coaching itself to be one modality which sort of is made to challenge the status quo to challenge the molds that we have sort of fit ourselves into and look for what are the other ways what are the different ways to live and be in the world yeah, and I think that's uh, part of being a leader, really, isn't it? Like, it's it's about coaching, mentoring. And, uh, you know, when I talk to emerging leaders and my students, it's really about, um, yeah, how do we, how do we, how do we mentor others? How do we enable others? And I think that's an important question that we should ask and we should ask uh, when we're working with, uh, with, co with clients as well as, you know, how are they mentoring? How are they enabling others? And so, yeah, it's that kind of education of practice. Freedom is the same thing in, in coaching as well. That, uh, yeah, how are we enabling others to uh, wake up in the world and to to lead? Absolutely. So, taking a cue from these invigorating questions that we are throwing more for the coaches to ask themselves and reflect back on, and leading a little bit towards eco coaching. Now, it's interesting that eco-coaching, which seems like a new niche that is emerging these days, and the point is that we do not have a agreed definition around eco-coaching. You know, a lot of people are doing a lot of things. And so we thought it'll be good to explore. And from your practice and from your experience, what do you think is eco-coaching? And how do you, you know, integrated in your leadership consulting practice? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I think when we first started communicating um, about this event, you mentioned about echo coaching and, you know, we're seeing a lot of this about uh, climate change, coaching, echo coaching. And to me, and you know, that's enabled me to reflexively think deeper on this. And I think that for me, it's just showing up in a more holistic way Again, I think that in the world that we have uh, traditionally known and um, been part of, society has really, we've really, over the last 400 years, kind of with this Cartesian-Newton um, way where we separate body from mind and that spirit and so forth, we've really disconnected from where we come from, the, the origins of, of nature. Uh, so we've really kind of placed nature as something outside of us. And in a lot of ways, we become afraid of nature uh, going out into the wilds, right? We The wild is something to be tamed or uh, oppressed or exploited. Uh, so we've really kind of lost that connection. And I think we're paying the price for it on a global um, perspective, right? We're, we, we are seeing this dystopian world. We hear all about the climate crisis, uh, rising temperatures, rising CO2, melting glaciers. And so I think uh, we're seeing that we're, um, because of the way we've showed up and really disconnected and the way we've practiced um, it is having, um, yeah, very um, harsh effects on humanity and society. And so I think it's uh, coming back around to things like indigenous knowledge frameworks where we see all across the world where they've really been the holders and keepers of the land and they've really 
always connected to this idea of reciprocity, understanding that it's not just a human centric one way um, way of showing up that we what's in it for us, but they see it as a re reciprocal relationship that they have a responsibility to the land and um, also they get something back from the land as well. And so I think that echo coaching to me is really about building awareness for humanity to uh, to understand that we are our origins are from nature that we're every bit a part of it. Uh, my dad, I remember my dad, who I recently lost, um, would tell me he'd say, "Can't look at your hands, you know, look at your hands. They're thir thirteen billion years old, made out of star stuff, right? That it, out of a supernova, a big bang. And this is what scientific truth. This is one belief of scientific truth tells us that that's our origins. That's how all the cosmos has been created, and including our Earth, 4.55 billion years ago, and then we became we're part of that. We came out of out of all of that, and so that my atoms are made out of out of star stuff, and so this idea that when you start to understand the this idea of um, the Earth's origins, the story of the universe, the story of the Earth, you start to understand that this is where we are from, that it's not something separate from us. And when you start to do practices where you go out and spend time in nature and that connection, that can deepen that. And what else, the other side of it too, is this, uh, I guess, echo coaching. And I, I was telling you about a program that I just came out of this past weekend that was called Rewilding the, the Leader, where I took uh, individuals out into the wild um, where we didn't even have internet connection. It was just a three day, three and a half day program. But what I, when I talk to uh, the participants, it's really about, which is, it is part of a coaching practice, I would say, is, is to tell them that, you know, this deep connection with, with nature is also uh, an opportunity to deeply connect with yourself. Uh, because when you start to sit still and silence kind of all that cultural uh, way of being, it really sheds away and you start to connect to that uh, really deep down authentic uh, person that you are uh, that can connect to what's important like values and what's your purpose. Um, so that is, um, I don't know if I, I haven't said it con uh, concisely perhaps, but really echo coaching to me is really about a more holistic way of showing up to understand that uh, we're connected to something deeper than society, that it's it's more looking at things from uh, earth uh, systems and relational standpoint. Wow. So what shows to me in that is like, we are taking our acknowledgement and awareness, not just from our immediate human society, but to a larger system that we are a part of. And I absolutely love the way you shared about your dad and what he said to you about, like, look at your hands. What is it really made of? Because so often, like, of course, we live in this body, we operate through this mind, but we barely ever take time to just sit back and appreciate that, wow, like, what exactly is this sort of made of? And I remember one of my personal experience in epiphany, which sort of uh, is a no-brainer, of course. But the moment I got aware of it, it, you know, it sort of changed and shifted so much for me. So it was when I was uh, carrying my second baby, my boy, and I went for that normal ultrasound work and all and so I'm lying in the bed and the doctor is doing the stuff and I'm just looking and it was that moment when you you know the fetus developed the heartbeat and all so so the doctor told me that oh yeah you'll see this little heart beating and right in that moment I had a thought and I was like I looked at the little heart beating inside my body and I was like god I'm having two hearts inside my body so like this one human body has two beating hearts in it right now. And if you look at it, yes, of course, like every woman who carries a child has at that point of time two hearts. And then I was like, it's, it's 
I don't know what was in that epiphany in, in that moment, but just becoming consciously aware of that fact sort of changed so much in me, changed the whole way I looked at me and my relationship with my children. And, and there was something different in that moment. So I, I have the same feeling when you say, look at your hands and say, what is it really made of? It's made of so much of history. It's made up of the star elements that we are. So thank you so much for bringing that insight into the conversation today. Because what I had been sort of uh, reading and researching a little bit on internet about what eco-coaching is like, okay, so you go in the nature, you take the walk with the client and do all of that. But I reckon that this is way much deeper in the way you sort of explained and shared it. So can you say a little more about this rewilding the leaders? Like what exactly happens and how do you bring that sort of an awareness in the in the people? Yeah, I first uh, got really, I, I've always been uh, from my background as a, I think I was on my dad's back at when I was just months old, uh, trekking through the Rockies. So I was always, uh, from my upbringing, always really connected with nature and the cosmos, so starring and so forth. So I always had that in me. But then, you know, uh, really got uh, into the, you know, went to university, went to business school, learned about economics and shareholder primacy and 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 those things, and really kind of moved away from that. But I find, uh, you know, talking about having kids, when I had my two kids, it really kind of brought me back to uh, asking a lot of questions of, of what are my values. And, you know, I went on to do my master's in leadership and then my doctorate as well. And I, I through just that journey, um, I read, I remember reading, uh, some of you may be familiar with Peter Senge. Uh, there's a book that he has presence that he writ with uh, Betty Sue Flowers, uh, Joseph Jaworski and Oda Sharma. And there was a chapter in there where I read about uh, Joseph Jaworski going on this uh, sacred passage with this guy, John Milton, down in Baja, Mexico, where he had these whale experiences. And I literally, I remember when I read that, I got really emotional. And I'm like, I need to do this. I need to do this. And I actually contacted the woman down in Connecticut uh, and connected with the jo Joseph J Jaworski. How can I connect with this John Milton? And you know, I, I think within um, a year and a half later, I was doing one of those, uh, did a 10 day sacred passage down in Baja, Mexico with this John Milton, who's a, an amazing, uh, amazing person, amazing mentor and teacher to me today. Um, but this really opened up a whole journey for me and this, and then I, I saw the potential in it from a leadership perspective, you know, when I had that time with the land, just seeing how it really changes you again, how it sheds away cultural barriers and where you really start to have this deep time connection with nature and where you come from. And I think the another deep part is that all one time with yourself and you start to really understand who you are um, and you get it, you know, you move away from the, the busyness of what we, what we call that busyness and um, you start to see things differently and it really does change you, changes you forever. Uh, so that kind of opened things up for me. And then I did uh, my doctoral research around, around that as well. And, you know, what it's clear to me is that um, this, uh, when you spend time out in nature, it uh, really does kind of open the, a pathway to yourself uh, and to where you come from and does change the way you see things. You see things a lot from uh, what you hear from Indigenous knowledge frameworks, where it talks about this idea of interdependence, you understand that there's a web of life and we are just part of that. And also this idea of reciprocity that we, we come together in reciprocal relationships. And this is through all of society and even moving outside, you know, all the animal and plant life, we're all interconnected to that. And really uh, it, it makes you keenly aware that we need to, all our decisions and actions should should bring this idea of interdependence and reciprocity into into it and we have not done that from uh 
humanity standpoint. And I think this is why we're in a lot of challenges that we're in. So I've seen the need for, and um, the pandemic has kind of shut down these opportunities, but uh, I've been waiting. Um, and finally, I was able to uh, get back to having a, this rewilding the leader nature retreat, which I just had my, we just had one last weekend where I gathered uh, people I had. I actually had someone from New York City fly in from New York City. I had uh, another participant from Toronto and the rest were from Nova Scotia. And it was in the, the uh, Cape Breton region of, of Nova Scotia on this, on the coastline. And the coastline really hasn't changed a lot over the years. It's pretty wild. And uh, through this time, we spent a lot of time just talking about some of these things about reciprocity. We do we even bring art in there because art has in a way of decentering people. Um, so we bring art, expressive art in there that comes from the school of Paul Keneal and, 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 and so forth. And um, yeah, and it's just an opportunity to really explore, explore how people are showing up in this uh, connection with nature. And also the participants do uh, a 24 at what I call all one time where they go out and uh, pitch a tent in the wild right on the coastline. Um, and we experience amazing sunsets, seeing the sun rise. Actually, we're spinning towards the sun in the morning, but we saw that every morning, the sun come up and uh, as we spun towards the sun. And then also at nighttime, the same thing, and get to see the Milky Way. And yeah, just a really, uh, really great way to show up. and. Uh, Everybody, I, I, I'm just getting feedback now, some formal feedback. I've got it out there, but I can tell that everybody came away with, uh, you could hear it in their voices, uh, came away with uh, a new way of uh, showing up. So, yeah, if anybody's interested, we're, we're having one next August, if anybody's interested. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that that does have a lot of value. And while you were uh, narrating it, you know, one question was popping up in my mind, but I think by the end of it, you sort of answered that question. So the question was like that, and I was just thinking that, yes, okay, so one one time you go out and you experience this oneness with the nature and you see that how you are a part of a larger system and not just the human society in the concrete jungles we've built around ourselves. And, but when you come back to, again, living in your cities and surroundings, would you sustain the same thought and feeling? But I think the way you answered it is in the, like, you get a way of looking at yourself, yeah, which I, I think, think is the key. Yeah, what we teach, uh, what we try to embody is this idea of reflex, the importance of reflexivity uh, to continue. We get caught up in the fullness, the sea of circuitry in our real world. Uh, so it's learning to slow down to really uh, connect with yourself and the world that surrounds you is really what it's about. So teaching those practices, we do some Tai Chi and Qigong um, uh, matter energy practices. Um, we do all of the time is really spent out. We have a, the weather was great. So we had a learning circle outside. So pretty well all of the, we do have a main cottage there, but pretty well all the time is spent outside, uh, whether on hikes, um, but just being in the land and uh, connecting with the land. And I think that, and I think this goes back to some of Robert Keegan's work and this work around constructive development and developmental theory, which we, a lot of people know from coaching that when you have a shift in mindset, right? When you when you are able to provide a stretch challenge or differentiation, it really changes mental models uh, forever that you can't go back. Uh, and it's kind of what David Bohm would refer to as moving conclusions. You know, our conclusions continue to move. And I think through this, what I call the stretch challenge where people's mindsets are challenged through this process, it really does uh, move from that idea of being embedded to differentiation and enables, uh, and it can, it can cause what I've found as well. It can cause uh, people, um, it can cause some disruption, right? With any, with any type of new thinking. Um, but it, that's where there's this breakthrough. What I see is a breakthrough opportunity 
to new ways of knowing and, and that from a leadership terms, it can allow for a new narrative, uh, new leadership identity as well. And you, where you start to uh, see the world in a different way, you start to see yourself in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not as much around just focusing on what habits you have or the way you're leading, but going deeper to the root of like, where is all of this emerging? Where is your way of living emerging from? And at that level, when there is a shift happens in the way you start to see yourself or see the world around you so that vision sort of then carry forward. I re remember something of that sort happened to me when I went out for a 10 days Vipassana retreat. Although it wasn't in a in a in a wild setting, though I now fancy that you know Vipassana combined with the wild and the being in nature would be even more powerful. But it was just a 10 days of just being with yourself, although there were other people also, but you're not even supposed to interact or talk to anybody or even have an eye contact or touch. So it's like you are on your own. You're not talking. You're not having any internet. Like you said, this is nothing of that sort in nature. And that was also a very liberating, a very transformative experience for me. And I think that bringing in nature and using nature as your playground or or your space like the nature holds the space for you while you coach your clients or while you sort of walk the journey with them I think it it, it is definitely quite powerful yeah and I think that the idea of echo coaching too as we're having this conversation I think it's even uh, as much as finding out your true nature within right that understanding that we put nature as something outside there and we and we separated ourselves from that, but really understand that we are a part of that and really going to what is your true nature. And I think that, you know, your example shows that you can get it more than you can discover your true nature in many different ways. And I think it's just really creating that space, uh, that holding environment that just really allows you to connect deeply with yourself. And uh, it's interesting because one of my participants, he is a, um, a senior leader in his organization. And one of the things that came up for him, and it was a very emotional thing for him, he realized that he was always trying, he was taking on very busy in his work life. Also very, he was taking on a lot of things outside of his organization. And he realized that he was just avoiding uh, the conversations with himself. And I find that there's a lot of people out there, and I'm sure we've all encountered those uh, people that uh, we are coaching where they just really keep busy lives and it's sometimes people avoid that reflection time because they don't want to see what is in the mirror and that ref in that reflection but it can be a really powerful thing when you can enable people to be able to see that reflection of themselves and that's where the real growth opportunity is um, and that can be a hard, hard uh, space for people to go into. It can be very emotional, as I experienced with this one uh, individual. Um, but when it it's, can be a real breakthrough for the individual as well, when they start to connect with that idea of true nature. So, you know, when I think about it, echo coaching could be that idea of really seeing that true nature of yourself. Beautiful. It's so wonderful. And thank you for calling it out because that happens all the time. We sort of build the lives around us and so that we don't get to see ourselves. Yeah, I'm, and so, I busy. I'm so busy, right? We hear this. <laughs> yeah, I'm so busy. busy. Right? I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to write in my journal. Oh, come on. Yes. What is it that you're trying to avoid? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, while you were talking, I, and you also named Otto Schrammer, and I remember I uh, when I attended uh, his program, that's the thought that was like from ecosystem to the ecosystem, how we are moving. And I think that sort of resonates quite highly with what you're doing is that from ego center to how we have learned to see ourselves, perceive ourselves, or look at the world we said okay go beyond that like ego is just a little box what's outside of that box there's more to life there is more to you 
as uh, as an entity and so it seems to me that eco coaching is that systemic coaching in a way where you include uh, nature so nature is the larger system yeah and i think that we all have ego right and i remember john milton uh, who i mentioned earlier one of my mentors saying that ego we all have ego right um and it shows up in pain and pleasure right when things are going well it's like how great am i or when things aren't going well you know it's like oh um, you know, you, the blame goes on. and um, But really, I think it's it's being aware, again, that when we slow down to be aware of that ego is presenting in pain and pleasure, and then start to understand, um, again, the, the world that surrounds us, that there's this otherness, right, that we, we're not so centered, uh, and our ego can put us there, really centered in this idea of what Adam Smith called the self-love, right, or self-interest. Um, and so, uh, and the capitalist world is very good at kind of putting us in the ego and being self in putting that self interest first or self love. But I think it's really understanding that this idea of otherness that, uh, we live in as this, uh, and I recommend a good read is Achiro Escobar. And I have that book here. I love this book here. Um, he calls it pluriverse politics, but just really understanding that we live in a, a pluriverse and that we need to uh, not only balance our, our self-love, self-interest, but need to balance the for the common good or the otherness in the world. And so that, and I think that's the idea of balancing the, the, the ego uh, and Asian cultures, uh, you know, they talk about the yin and the yang and, and so forth, but yeah, I think it's finding that that balance. And I think when you get to be more echo-centered, uh, it really does connect to the idea of otherness. That's so beautiful, the way you explain. And that otherness is such is present in, in so many powerful ways around us. And it's it's like, and it's always, all the time, so subtle that sometimes we don't even realize that, you know, that we've learned to just put ourselves in a in a different platform and others at completely different ways. And then it seems like that differences amongst us are like wider and we are not able to see that deep down at the essence of our existence, we are just one. And that's what even Indian, like Hinduism, the the basis of it is that oneness that conscious at conscious level we are all yes. one yeah yes yeah yeah and david boma and krista marte i don't know if you know their dialogues uh, uh philosophers uh from way back when but they talked a lot about this uh collective intelligence this oneness and i i love that concept uh that uh, you just explained that comes out of the hindi uh Hindu religion uh, of oneness. Uh, I think that's really important. It's very interesting. I would definitely love to read all of these books. And I also want to share with you Ram uh, Ramanathan, who owns Kocharya, is also uh, doing an interpretation of some of the ancient Vedic literature like Mandukya Upanishad, Isa Vaishya Upanishad, and a whole lot of other ancient literature that we have in India. And we'll soon be coming out with those ebooks, and I would share with you. I'm sure you would love them because you would resonate so deeply with with those ideas. And uh, yeah, see, yeah. This, is what I, this is what I love. Like uh, in these learning communities, like at this rewilding nature retreat, uh, I had one of the participants uh, was from India originally as well, now living in Canada. But when they we did a a, a part where we we work with clay and what he brought to the table was uh, the the elephant with the half tusk and the full tusk, Ganesh, Ganeshi? Yes, right? Ganesh, yeah. And he talked about that in the perspective of how we were showing up. And yeah, there's uh, so much to learn in this uh, world from one another. And this is what I really feel. My definition of leadership is really, it's not that it's a, a you know, We've we've put leadership as a, this person or collective, and traditionally it's been this 
white Euro male showing up charismatically solving all the problems. But to me, it's it's not even a person or a collective. It's it's this mutual participation of diversity that comes together. And it's that space between that bubbles up. And that's where they, this innovation, I think new exciting ways of showing up in the world uh, come from. Because when I hear you talking about uh, these different uh, frameworks, it's like, yeah, I want to learn about this, right? And that's where I think there's, if we can just open the world to uh, this uh, type of excitement to, to what we can learn from one another, uh, I think we could do some amazing things. Yeah, and even now it shows to me that just opening our minds, that's just bringing ourselves in the space of possibility to explore and, and from approaching something with a curious mindset also helps open it. And eventually if we, we find out that, oh, no, yeah, we, we feel a lot same than different, actually. And, and that sort of a beautiful epiphany happens. And one question that uh, that I sometimes think of, and I want your opinion on that, is that like currently we are listening, so many things happening and going around in the world. Yes, we know like scientists have been saying about the global warming and what we are doing to the earth for so many, many years. And then countries sort of collaborated around that. But now it seems like the whole world is ready to go on war with each other. And then there are natural calamities like flood in, in one part of the world and then drought in other part of the world. So it's it seems like it seems like the end is closer than we, we ever thought it would be. So in, in such a scenario, how do you think we, we make sense of what is it that we should be doing? Yeah, is there yeah. really something that we, we can do here? And, and in your view, like, what is that way forward for us? Yeah. Well, it's it's a tough position, because, and I hear for, I'm doing some research around this right now of hopelessness and helplessness, and this is what I've heard from my, the emerging leaders I work with, students, that they are, you know, we are all presented with this idea of a dystopian world. We see it in our movies, uh, video games, you know, it's everywhere, and the news, so we're presented with this idea of a dystopian world, and so what kind of shows up is this idea of I can't, I've, there's no hope for the future. I've heard students tell me that um, I'm not going to have kids because they don't feel like there's um, a good future for them. Or I, I hear that they feel like they can't make a difference. But um, what I've also found, though, is when you engage, when you open up mindsets to show that there are tools that people can use, like the sustainable development uh, framework that's coming out of the UN. Uh, also understanding this planetary boundaries framework that comes is came out of Europe about a decade ago that's just starting to get momentum. Um, when people start to see that there's tools that they can apply uh, and how to do business differently, uh, that world that I live in, um, it's they start to see that, yes, I can make a difference. And then also they start to have hope for the future. And I think that we need to look at the history of humanity that all when we when we get when we lean into conflict and really take it on, that it opens up creative portals for opportunity. And so what I feel is that um, it's important that people engage in in the process instead of disengaging and and I think that we have to, there's some people feel that there's this idea of deep adaptation that um, there's a group and, I, that, and I'm kind of around there as well that feel like, yes, we are kind of this, we're getting to this point where there's gonna be this collapse, this capital collapse of the world that we've known, right? How we've, how we've operated. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't do things differently. And I think that we need to start preparing um to be to mitigate and also adapt and this whole whole idea you hear all the time and i've even heard it coming from uh press releases from the united nations and so forth is we need to save the planet and i think that from our ego since we're always 
in our embedded in our ego. I think we need to get away from that because we know that when you start to realize history of the planet, it's 4.55 billion years old uh, years. And we've been here for a fraction of that. And the planet will continue to go on with or without us. Um, and that, uh, so it's this idea of saving the planet is, is a myth in my, in my opinion. And I think it should be more centered around, we need to save humanity. How do we, how do we save humanity so that we can continue to develop and flourish on the planet? And I think when we start to have that mind shift, then we'll be able to show up and do things differently. Um, and we are things, if you look around, there is a lot of changes happening. But the question is, is it quick enough? And we know that we're very, as human beings, though we are nothing but atoms and always shifting and changing, we're very habitual and pattern in how we show up in everyday life. And so how do we kind of quicken, quicken that to um, embrace kind of the changing world and the complexities? And I think that's where, as coaches, where we can enable people's mindset to connect to this more interdependent world to this um to see the reciprocity in the relationality and the communality of the world that we show up in wonderful thank you so much for reframing uh, this whole thing about save the planet to save the humanity because it seems more like yes something that we can influence or we can do about it and i i love the way you said that you know again we need to continue to keep looking out for, you know, where we are started to operate from our ego system. Like, are we looking at some challenge also from our ego? Because ego, of course, want to have that sort of a magnanimity, like, oh, I did something great. I did something huge. And it shows up sometimes even in the personal individual coaching conversations also, where you notice that the client is actually deliberately like, People choose not to work on issues which do not seem like grand enough, worthy enough or important enough. Whereas everything that or every challenge or every hurdle need to be addressed, need to be attended to. So thank you so much for bringing back again the, you know, uh, to the point that, hey, are you again getting trapped into the, your ego while looking at the entire situation? Mm -hmm. And it does seem hopeless when we look at it like that. But you're right. The the planet uh, will stay with or without us. It's uh, how are we wanting to stay? How are we wanting to live on this planet is, is the question really. And that is something which is within our reach and within our grasp to do something about. So yeah. thank you. And, I, and you just hear that whole, I, you know, when that idea of saving the planet, again, that's our ego thinking that we can fix and save things, right? We're, we've been very good at that, at, at trying to feeling that, you know, our ego that we can fix everything. And I think that I love the, if you know any of Nora Bateson's uh, work, she says that, you know, we need to get into the rhythm of the planet. That's the important part. I think she says something like, it's not to crack the code. I have it back here on my board because I loved it when I read it. Uh, she says, it's not to crack the code. You know, we always feel like we need to solve the challenges, the problems. And she says, it's not to crack the code, but it's to get into the rhythm of, of living on the planet. And I think that's what we have to do. You know, we, we have this, I think it's no doubt that in my mind that, uh, you know, scientific truth tells us that we are in a climate crisis. Um, that we, uh, you know, the human made climate crisis because of the increase in CO2. And we're seeing it everywhere. And, you know, we're not, we're not uh, separate from here in Canada, we've, we've seen uh, floods and fires here in Canada, and, and so forth. Um, and so it's really about how do we really get how do we embrace? And this whole idea we hear about we got to fight climate change, we got to Again, that language again, it's not about fighting. It's really about getting into the rhythm. Like how do we how do we embrace climate change? And it means mitigating and adapting. So I think that's what we have to look at is as a human society, how do we get into the rhythm of of a of a changing, a rapidly changing uh, world of complexity? And it's going to continue 
you know, we've gone from, you know, 200 and what is it, 222 years ago, the population on the planet was 1 billion people. We today are at seven point, I think it's 7.8 billion people on the planet. And National Geographic, uh, if it all goes as planned, we're going to be 9, 9 billion on the planet by 2040. And if you look at the world clock, it's 250,000 new people on the planet each day. So I live in Nova Scotia. Every, every four days, we have another population of Nova Scotia on the planet. So this is creating more pressure as the complexity of the world's changing. So we definitely need to do things differently. We need to get into the rhythm as far as, you know, from my perspective. Absolutely. Love this language and the metaphor of getting into the rhythm and seeing how this rhythm, where exactly it is taking us. And to me, it, it always brings to that beautiful intersection of like, yes, we are exploring the artificial intelligence and all of those things. But, uh, but the more we are going that in that direction, I feel that need to go back to our roots and go back to the the indigenous, the native ways of being and living with our surrounding become even more and more important. So it's not like we have we are moving in one direction only. No, it's like and how are we expanding and including everything alongside. So yes, we got to embrace technology, but not at the cost of the ways of our ancestors, not at the cost of the wisdom of those people who probably knew this rhythm better than we know it now. So it's also yeah. about reaching out to those places and learning. Yeah, and it's really important you bring up important that coming back to indigenous knowledge frameworks. And I love um, Albert Marshall, who's a Nigma elder here in Nova Scotia. He coined the frame two-eyed seeing. And two-eyed seeing is the idea, if you're not, uh, if you don't know the definition, it's really about looking out of one eye from an indigenous perspective, another eye from a Western perspective. So it's kind of the merging of, of the two um, and I think this is so important, again, um, and this is this idea of diversity, bringing the diversity of our world together. And, uh, you know, we've seen indigenous, um, indigenous people across the world. You know, you look in Brazil, they have been really the protectors of the land and they're paying for it with their lives. More indigenous people, land protectors have been murdered um, and it continues to grow every year under in Brazil, in, in South America, protecting uh, the land. They see, because they've always understood the importance of it, the reciprocity and, and interdependence. And if that we don't look after it, uh, it's not good for the future. Um, so I think it's important for us to really, and we've been really good, as you mentioned in the beginning, come all about this reconciliation process in Canada, but what I talk to my students with, what I share with them is that the real value of it is moving, moving, yes, doing the reciprocity, but really embracing and celebrating um, that way of, of, of showing up, that there's real value because that's what they really espouse this idea of, again, interdependence and reciprocity. And I keep on saying these words, but I really see that is so important for the future of humanity. Excellent. Wonderful. You know, this conversation is opening up and expanding my way of looking at uh, not just eco-coaching, but coaching itself. And I, I've observed and noticed so much of reframing and so much of, you know, having a deeper look into our own language, like are we, is our language more egocentric or it's more ecocentric? It's more something that we can really influence, something which is more liberating to us instead of putting us into the hopelessness situation. So I think that's also one of the important takeaway for me from this conversation. Yeah, and I don't know if anybody out there uh, is doing a lot of work with expressive art, but I really believe this idea of art uh, is so important. Um, from a leadership perspective in the business world, we don't 
we don't always see the the value of it uh, or people are afraid you know because it's art but from my experience since i've really been introduced to it and i really encourage people out there to do uh expressive art you can look it up paul Keneal, who's out of switzerland uh, uh the levines uh, sean mcnutt but they do and i've really incorporated this work into work with undergraduate MBA students. Um, and what we, from a human perspective, we, we, we connect to the arts and the arts really allow us to decenter. And that's, I think one of the big things when you do expressive art therapy or sessions, it really allows the individual to decenter from that known language, that known consciousness. And what will happen is that unconscious can bubble up that people didn't even know was there and it can enable new language because we get so connected to um old language that we can't let go of and i think that we do need to start using new language in how we show up and i think that when we when we do things like expressive art it really decenterate decenters us from old ways of knowing and knowing and allows new things to bubble up, which can be amazing. And I've seen it, I, I'm always amazed when I when I work with it, then I'm, there's that always that inner critic and uh, the in, in myself when I'm like, oh, are people gonna be receptive to this? You know, that these are business executives, but when I do it, it is always reconfirms that how powerful it is. Uh, yeah, it's it's so interesting that you say that and you bring that art and creativity in this space of eco-coaching as well, because last month our theme was creativity and we did have some uh, creative artists, some poets and some theater artists who also work in this space of uh, self-development and transformation come and sp speak to us on the same lines that art isn't just for somebody to become professionally qualified at some skill but it's it's a way of life it's a way of expressing it's a way of learning to be in this world so thank you again for you know bringing in this topic into the conversation and it's sort of so beautifully sort of what you're saying is so beautifully sort of tying the last month to the next month where we are going to go because next month for September we've chosen the theme of sustainability which is emerging in a, in a great way from uh, what we are having a conversation around today and although we are like coming close to our conversation but I would really love for you to share with us what you're doing in this space of sustainability and uh, leave us coaches with a question that you would want us to reflect on for the next month we will put that in our community portal on coach nook so that people can revisit and yeah. connect with it yeah sure uh, recently i was awarded a federal grant the the shirk shirk grant uh, social science and humanities research council uh, a large grant to explore the sustainable development goals and I'm sure most of you are aware of the UN's um, initiative that has the 2030 agenda, which 17 sustainable development goals from no hunger to gender equality, to reduce inequalities, life below land, life under land, justice, uh, partnerships, climate change. So there's many of these goals. If you And if you're not familiar, you can just look up sustainable development goals. And what I've found is that a lot of, there is not a lot of awareness. Um, these, these were adopted of the millennial goals, um, but they came into fruition in, out of the Paris COPE, COPE I think it was COPE uh, 25 or 2025 uh, in Paris in 2015, they were adopted. Every country uh, signed off except for two. Uh, so it is a world framework that we've agreed upon that we really need to embrace this framework to be more to to really flourish on the planet and to right the ship, so to speak. And so how are we doing? We found out uh, out of uh, Copenhagen, uh, I believe that was COP26. I think I've got them right. 
this COP27 is coming up in Egypt, I think in December, but basically saying that we're falling short of those goals. So I was really interested in what are we doing from a university community at Dalhousie. Uh, we've yet to make a, we're doing things around sustainability, but we've we've yet to make that uh, major statement that say we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050 and have a really coherent strategy. I, we, I haven't heard that. So I really decided, okay, I want to explore sustainable development at my university and use it as a case study. So I put a, a, a study grant proposal together and I was awarded this grant. So uh, I've just freshly hired a research assistant. We'll be hiring another one coming up, but uh, working with some other researchers at my institute where we have brought different players uh, across the university where we're just going to explore that and really try to understand things at our institution. So first of all, we'll be uh, exploring where are we right now from a baseline uh, sustainable development and how does it reflect on the sustainable development framework. And then, um, then the next part is using this method called the 17 rooms approach, which comes out of uh, institution in the US um, that uh, really examines how can we have a direct action? What kind of action plan strategy can we put together right away so we can start um, living sustainable development? And hopefully that'll affect Paul, you know, what we come up with, we'll publish, uh, articles around this and share globally because you know that's that's how I kind of found got the courage to do this reading what other institutions were doing and hopefully really influence and co-inspire other institutions really to take up the call for sustainable development but what I would say I guess the question that I would leave everybody is are you familiar with sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda and if not why not and the next part is, once you start to understand them, how can you implement them into your practice? You can't take all 17, but what might be ones that you attach? It's kind of like an exercise that I do with my students where they look at an organization and they look at the SDG framework and then they see, okay, what, what SDGs, um, are a priority for this organization and attached to the value chain. So what I would say to you as coaches, looking at your own value chain or your own coaching practice, what SDGs might you really ground your practice in and that you explicitly share with your clients? And how? And through this, you can build awareness for your clients because this isn't the perfect framework, but it's a the one thing about this framework, there's two things, it's universal, it can, doesn't matter where you are on the planet, it's a universal framework that everyone can connect to because it's really centered around human rights. And so, and, and that would be the second part. It's really centered and grounded in human rights and universal. So for those two reasons, I think every coach should make that a part of their practice. Um, so those, I guess that would be the question is, are you familiar with the SDG and the 2030 uh, framework? If not, and how can you? And the second part is, how are you gonna explicitly um, incorporate this into your framework, into your coaching model? And so you can enable others awareness as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Kent, for these questions and this invigorating thought around uh, developing our, deepening our understanding of the eco-coaching and leaving us with a lot more to explore in the coming month. Um, thank you for taking the time out. As it was a pleasure. And uh, I guess we've come to the end. I was gonna say I'm always open for questions, but uh, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to share my contacts. I'd be happy to take any questions or uh, just share any insights people uh, that bubble up for people, so. Thank you so much. We'll do that. I'll share your LinkedIn profile as well uh, at our community portal. Thank you so much again um, for your good work and doing so much of reframing and bringing in quite a lot of hope in, in us as well. And yeah, thank well, you, everybody. That... 
for joining in us today. Uh, and please feel free to go ahead and look at what we've discussed today again on the YouTube and uh, stay connected. Thank you so much, Professor. Pleasure, pleasure to be here with your learning community. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.